They are our family, and we only want the best for them. No standing water means clean, good tasting, algae free, mosquito free, and virus free water. No risk of electric shock, no risk of fire from faulty wiring. Cool water in the summer, warm water in the winter. Water delivered fresh from the water supply at 50 degrees year round. Drinking post water. The rural American lifestyle. It's how we work, and it's how we play. It's how we learn, and how we enjoy the finer things in life. How we take care of our animals, and tend to the land. It's a way of life. Has been for hundreds of years. Now there's a whole new way for rural America to watch TV. We're at the Equus Film Festival in New York City. This is the first panel discussion on soaring. First of all, thank you all for coming, and thank you, the panel, for all of you coming. I know some of you travel distances. Uh, we have a, a, an amazing pool of talent on this panel, which is soaring. What are they thinking? One aspect of the Tennessee walking course, the uh, performance walking course. We're going to deal with uh, another aspect of the Tennessee walking show course tomorrow at 4 o'clock between uh, 4 and 5.30. And we'll be dealing with the training, the showing, and then what happens with the courses after that. So if you have continued interest, please come back. I wanted to, to show you when I we put this panel together. This is the breadth of knowledge that we have here, so I'm great respect for everybody that's here, and I think that you will enjoy them. Uh, my name is Candace Wade, and I'll, I'm going to start introducing people. Um, I'm going to give a brief bio on all of you, and if I've missed something or done it incorrectly, then when you do answer the question that I put to you, you can go ahead and fix it. We do only have an hour, and because I, I did contact most of you uh, to have an idea of some of the things that we were going to talk about, I want you to have a chance to talk about everything you need, but uh, do keep in mind that we have four other panelists. We will have a question and answer period before we break, so if you have any questions, you can direct it to a specific panelist, and at that time, if you think that you need more time to answer a question, you can do it. We will also have free reign out here. What happened last time is uh, the group met outside and the audience continued to speak with the panelists and it was quite exciting and lively, so we can do that. To my left here, uh, we have Clant Say. He is a publisher of uh, BillyGoBoy.com. He's the organizer of Citizens Campaign Against Big Lick Animal Cruelty author of The Sore World of the Big Lick, Tennessee Walking Horse in Natural Horse Magazine. Uh, that was uh, 2014. Um, he's a reporter, a protest leader. He's a horse soaring activist. Uh, he, let's see, uh, his client, Pat Stout, who's the VP of horse shows for the uh, for Tweeba, uh, conducted the past act poll for that organization and that is the Tennessee Walking Horse Breeder and Exhibitors Association. Uh, and uh, do I understand that you were also a breeder from 1981 to 2005? That's correct. Okay, good. Uh, Jeannie McGuire is one of the founders of the All-American Walking Horse Alliance. She's the uh, co-creator of the Walk on Washington event in 2014. She's a multi, has multi-breed experience as a trainer and instructor, including performance horses. Has purchased and rehabilitated performance horses. As an, as an advocate, has established many strong working relationships with members of the U.S. Congress and the Senate as a lobbyist. Dr. Gregory Barroza is a practicing veterinarian. He's the founder and chief of staff at the New York Long Island Equine Medical Center was a pioneer in the use of thermography with experience in the use of Equus scan, diagnostic imaging, and soundness evaluation of racehorses. He's an award-winning print journalist and media consultant with over 100 publications and productions to his credit, publishes under Horse Doc and uh, Talking Horses.
Then we have Teresa Vivin. She's the president and on the board of directors of Bosch Friends of Sound Forces, an uh, organization that has fought soaring abuse for 15 years. She testified before the House Energy and Commerce Committee in support of the PAST Act, which is Prevent All Soaring Techniques. Met with Tom Bisback, the USD Secretary, uh, excuse me, USDA Secretary, organizer of four sound horse conferences, which, uh, excuse me, uh, I just lost my place. Which brought together major equine veterinary and animal welfare experts to explore solutions to stop soaring. Uh, she ensures that uh, the Bosch website offers consistent education on sound care of Tennessee walking horses as well as current topical events. <coughs> Mr. Duke Thorson, he's the owner and operator of Thor Sport Training Farm in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Uh, the, the horses on his property include independent owned horses of various breeds, including performance Tennessee watching for show horses. He's a partner in uh, Protect the Harvest, Lobby Group, and Super Pack. He's the owner of Thor Sport Racing, which is a NASCAR, I understand. Is it trucks and cars? Uh, he is uh, on the leadership council of the Tennessee Walking Horse National Celebration. He's on the board of directors of Performance Show Horse Association, otherwise known as PSHA, and on the board of directors of the Walking Horse Owners Association, otherwise known as WOA. You need to retract the whole thing about PTA. Pardon me? No, you need to retract the PTA deal. Duke is a supporter. He's not part of it to protect the harvest deal. That was a that was a dig on Duke. Can we address that okay. after? Well, I wanted to address it when you did it. Well, let's, well, the audience will have a chance to ask questions or correct the record. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> change.org petitions opposing the animal cruelty of the Big Lake Tennessee walking horse. In early March, almost 6,000 people signed a petition asking the University of Mississippi Medical Center to sever ties with the Big Lake Mississippi Charity Horse Show. In six short days, the University Children's Hospital announced it would no longer accept donations from the event due to the national controversy over the training and treatment of the Big Lake horses. In Jackson, Mississippi, the citizens boycotted the horse show. A reporter at the show took a video of a three-year-old class with one horse noticeably stumbling, obviously sore. The video went viral and has now reached almost 300,000 people. The video shows the animal cruelty of the Big Lick Tennessee walking horse. As shown by these empty stands, the public did not attend the horse show. In the past, the horse winning the championship was found to be sore. In Alabama, over 70% of the people voting in the Decatur Daily Newspaper online poll disapproved of the community hosting the annual Walking Horse Trainers Show due to the animal cruelty, the soaring of the Big Lake Tennessee Walking Horse. As shown by these empty stands, the public did not attend the horse show. Now the citizens' battle against this animal cruelty has come to Tennessee. Ninety percent of the soaring of Tennessee walking horses takes place within this circle. For years it was accepted in many, many Middle Tennessee communities, but with the passage of years, society has changed and now it is no longer accepted. In 2012, the state's flagship university, the University of Tennessee, banned the Big Lick World Grand Champion from Neyland Stadium at the homecoming football game. In 2012, it started a new Tennessee tradition, that of a flat shot natural Tennessee walking horse being ridden by winners of youth 4-H competition. Here is Kimbrell Hines up on a daring affair. In 2013, Caroline Emery, 
up on Amazing Grace, trained by Cat Dye of Winchester, Tennessee. And in 2014, Brooke Daly from Chapel Hill, Tennessee, up on Rose. One by one, Middle Tennessee communities have decided they do not want any part of the animal cruelty of the Big Lick as who they are. One of the first to drop the Big Lick shows was Franklin, Tennessee. Then Murfreesboro followed. This spring, after 57 years, the city of Gallatin said no more animal cruelty of the Big Lick. Now, Columbia, Tennessee is the largest city in the state still hosting a Big Lick Tennessee walking horse show. In fact, three shows will be held there in 2015. Two of the shows came from Florida where they fell. These shows are all held at the Murray County Park. Concerned horse owners from the, throughout America designed and paid for this billboard to ban the Big Lick. They oppose animal cruelty. Columbia, Tennessee has been invaded by the sore Big Lick to showcase this animal cruelty. It is not the fault of the community. The citizens of Tennessee have now decided they're going to peacefully assemble and speak out against Big Lick shows in their communities. A Change.org petition protested the Gulf Coast Charity Horse Show in Columbia at the end of April. Over 5,000 persons from every state in the Union, along with people from over 80 foreign countries, said, no more animal cruelty, no more Big Lick Tennessee walking horse. The protest started in Nashville on April 24, when these people peacefully assembled on West End Boulevard in front of Centennial Park. Two persons came to support them. One was Clay Harlan, grandson of one of the founders of the Tennessee walking horse breed. The other was a second generation former Big Lick horse trainer, Carl Bledsoe, who has spoken out and revealed the secrets of how the Big Lick Tennessee walking horse is created. The next day, the citizens went to Columbia, Tennessee to protest the Gulf Coast Cherokee Horse Show. They peacefully assembled at the Murray County Park. They spoke out against the animal cruelty as the big rigs, including the big lick horses, arrived at the show. These ordinary citizens represent the over 40,000 persons who signed the petitions speaking out against big lick animal cruelty. The people of Columbia, Tennessee did not attend the horse show, as you can tell from the empty stands and showgrounds. After the failure of the Gulf Coast Charity Horse Show on Friday night, they left like the circus and moved Saturday night to Shelbyville, Tennessee. This is the ground zero of animal cruelty of the Big Lake Tennessee walking horse. On Sunday morning, the Daily Herald newspaper in Columbia, Tennessee featured front page news on the Big Lake Walking Horse Show. It reported the show had left town and was now under scrutiny for soaring and inhumane treatment. The editor wrote, the industry, crawling on its knees with two black eyes, stands on the precipice of a great comeback or a colossal collapse. For the next three weeks, the focus will be on Columbia and Murray County, Tennessee. On May, May 28th through the 30th, there will be the annual Columbia Spring Jubilee. The show started in 1950, before walking horses were mistreated. A new Change.org petition has started, and already in one week, almost 2,000 people have signed it. It calls for a boycott of the three-day horse show. It urges the citizens of Columbia and Murray County to turn their backs on the animal cruelty being held in their community. Columbia is a beautiful small city of 33,000 people, about an hour south of Nashville. Yet against its will, it is the center of this fight for the humane treatment of Tennessee walking horses. The community did not support the Gulf Coast Charity Horse Show, which left town after one night. Columbia Mayor Dean Dickey Murray County Mayor Charlie Norman and the Columbus, Columbia City Council and County Commissioners and the people they represent now have a decision to make whether or not they will decide if they want the Big Lick Tennessee walking horse abuse to end in their community. All America urges them to turn their back on animal cruelty and boycott the Big Lick Spring Jubilee. Let us begin. Uh, what I'm going to do is uh, I will put together some questions and I will direct them to specific panel members if it's a question that in which you have interest, there'll be time afterwards that you can speak. I want to make sure everybody has a chance to speak. It's a five-person panel. And as I said before, uh, the audience will have a lot of time to ask questions, correct anything they think is incorrect, and uh, we'll be able to, if we run out of time here, we can go out there and talk as long as you want. Okay, uh, what is soaring? What are some of the methods used to soar Tennessee walking horses? And keep in mind, please, we're going to exclude the uh, shoes and equitation. Uh, we're dealing more with foreign substances and uh, uh, 
foreign objects, things that are typical soaring. Uh, Teresa, would, would you start with that, please? Um, yes, I'm happy to. Um, soaring is the deliberate infliction of pain upon, oh, sorry about that. upon the front legs and hooves of a horse to achieve a highly exaggerated gait in the show ring. Um, there are various methods used to soar horses. I would say that they were more apparent years ago than they have been more recently. Um, in the past, usually the caustic chemicals would be placed, slathered on the horse's legs, they would be wrapped in saran wrap, and then the horses would be ridden with um, action devices, actually we call them chains, on their legs, and that would beat against the sore flesh. The horses would be inspected before going into the show ring to see if they would react to palpation. Um, and that's when the um, numbing agents started taking over, and so the horse would be um, tr treated with numbing agents before going into the ring so they could pass inspection. But as I said, the whole idea is to achieve um, a painful gait so that the horses lift their legs higher as they go around the show ring. Thank you. Uh, Clint, what else would you like to add? Denise, could you please bring me those posters over there? What I would like to add is to show you the implement of soaring. Here's a eight pound shoe removed from a horse, Jen's ice glimmer. Glimmer was rescued going to slaughter uh, in July 28, 2015. Uh, he was saved by the Horse Plus Humane Society of Bowenwall, Tennessee. Uh, we had no idea when we saved Glimmer what his record was. Excuse Here me, Clint, can we, can we deal some No, I want to deal with this. No. Yes, Clint. I am. This horse, this, this has to do with Clint. the story, and it Clint. has to do with the shoe. There will be time now, listen, to talk about it. I feel like I'm being censored. This is the most important thing that we can do. I asked you a specific question, and Here's I want to question. deal with it. There will be other no, chances to question. talk about this. I want to talk about the mechanics. There may be people here that don't understand what the story is. The mechanics are, is they take these eight-pound shoes, and they put them on the horse's foot, and they have lead in the bottom, and then they put these chains right here on these horses, <coughs> and it causes him to throw his legs up high. We are going to ask you to show to see the road of the horse. We don't want to get into any rules, but you need to follow what you need to I was just following you. <coughs> Let her tell you what she wants. I can't ever tell you what to say. I'll be glad to answer. I am on it. I am it's specific. What is soaring? What are some of the methods of soaring, excluding the shoes? You soaring have the chains. Soaring is big lick animal curl. Soaring is created by putting heavy shoes on the horse's feet, and then they put chemicals on the pastern area of the horses above the hoof, and then they put the chain. It's the only horse breed in America that's shown with chains in the ring. Uh, USEF will not allow this horse at any of its events. Uh, Mr. Thorson is here, and I'm happy to see him representing the celebration. He's the Horseman's Leadership Council. Later, we'll have a discussion with Mr. Casey Wade's permission regarding the VAC, which is the Veterinary Advisory Committee, which has been discredited twice in 2014 and 2015. We're going to stand subject. Thank yes, you. Thank okay. You. Thank you very much. Uh, what do the terms <laughs> action devices and stewarding mean? I've do you, do you want to address that? Action devices? Action devices. First, the term stewarding. Yeah, an action device. Stewarding. Uh, action device would be uh, up to a six ounce action device. Uh, but but until I learned about this, I didn't know what an action device was. And I don't know if everybody here is familiar with walking horses. What, it, what specifically? It would be similar to what he has there. I think he's got a little larger than six ounces. Okay, so is, is it the shoe? Is there anything no, else? it's an action device that would go around the bottom. That's the action device. There's, there's several breeds that have action devices. Those are 13 points. Those are all rollers. Those are rollers. Hi, please. That's not the shoe. We're not having a debate. It's his turn Those to talk. Those would be rollers. Uh, okay. Are rollers considered an action device? Yeah, they would not be allowed in the show. Okay. But they're used at the barn, correct? Hi, right? please. Oh, I'm not sure. Uh, Jeannie, do you have anything that you would add uh, regarding stewarding or action devices? Well, I think that um, Mr. Thorson um, is accurate with explaining the action device. The action device is, is basically a chain that's legal in the show ring, and they also are um, chains and rollers that are used in the barn. So there's two different kinds. The chains that we are talking about as an action device is legal in the show ring is six ounces. Is that correct, Mr. Thorson? Thank you. All right, so then moving on. The other thing that you asked about was stewarding. Stewarding is a term that has been applied to the process 
of basically manipulating or punishing a horse for reacting to pain when it's being inspected. So um, their USDA is familiar with this process. They feel that this happens from time to time. When an exhibitor presents a horse to inspection that is sore, and they do not want that horse to be determined to be sore by the inspector, what they've done back in the barn is divert the horse's attention with another painful action. Sometimes is as extreme as alligator clips on the scrotum or in the gum. But anything to literally just to distract the horse with one kind of pain from the other pain that he's having. Did that help? Yes, thank you. Uh, Clint, did you have anything else you wanted to discuss about stewarding or action devices, something that we didn't cover? In the Jackie McCall video, they were hitting the horse on the head, teaching him not to react to pain when they pick up his foot, which has been sensitized to pain. Also, in the Larry Whelan barn, which was in Maryville, Tennessee, which was an ongoing case that the Billy Boy.com blog covered all the events. They had a barbed wire uh, harness device they fit on top of the horse's head around his ears, where if he moved when they picked his foot up, he would hurt. Would that be considered Yes, ma'am. It's okay. teaching the horse not to react to pain when they pick up his feet. You create a greater pain somewhere else for the horse, where then he doesn't. And it's all about inspection. Thank you. Uh, what effect does, we call it the big lick performance horses, they're wearing these shoes in the show ring, uh, what effect does the big lick movement have on the physiology of a horse? Uh, Dr. B. Um, I guess I've been asked to comment on, I can't believe 36 years as a veterinarian, this is a pretty obvious thing. You don't need to be a degree to see that what's going on here is the fact that these horses are being caused to exaggerate their gait. The question is where is it where does the training end and where does the excessive punishment begin? But these are naturally beautiful horses that move in the manner that they're they're bred to move in. But the exaggerated gait now is in some ways being made to entertain the public. I'm not here to decide what weight that should be at. I'm not here to decide where it should end and where abstraction of another sort should begin, but there's clearly an issue going on. I, I, I don't know what more I can say about it. Thank you. Jeannie, what can you add to uh, what effect does this movement, the big lip movement, have on the physio physiology of a horse, rather than just the feet, what the rest of the body? That's actually an interesting question because I think that we are so focused in seeing the legs and the feet of the horse that we tend not to also notice what's going on in the rest of the horse's body. Um, usually, typically, and almost always, when you see the image of a big leg horse, the back is inverted. When the back of the horse is inverted, upside down, which many good horsemen and women know that is inappropriate, not only inappropriate, but harmful to the horse, it also does things internally and viscerally. So basically what will happen is, is that the entire um, the thoracic sling collapses as the cervical column is penetrated downwards <coughs> and, deep and deep into the chest in that position. A lot of times what we see is a big lick horse after a 10 minute round around the ring completely vascular and sweaty and frothy and it isn't because he's a pure and wonderful athlete, it's because his circulation and his respiratory system is compromised. It's actually a limited, and he is not able to completely breathe and have perfect circulation in that position. Thank you. This, excuse me, we're going to have to wait to the end. Just, if you want a piece of paper so you can make no, notes, right. we, we want to hear what you have to say. Thank you. Okay, I, I think all of us can say here, nobody thinks that, that putting chemicals on a horse is a good idea. I mean, I, I think we'd all feel that we are against soaring per se. But why do some trainers soar? Uh, and I've heard the term uh, soaring culture. And uh, Dr. B, I, I'm assuming that you did you do a lot of work in horse racing, that there are things that people in uh, the thoroughbred world do. So it's basically you know, hurting a horse. Why do trainers soar? What, what is the soaring culture? 
do can you can you address that? I mean, I don't know why they would soar. I mean, soaring, I guess, would be because they're probably lazy and trying to shortcut something. Um, so to detect soaring, I think is the real important thing here. Can you say that again? To detect soaring. Can you tell him the mics we can hear? So the important thing I believe is how do you stop soaring? So if soaring exists, you have to find soaring. So the way that the laws are written today, it's all based on subjective testing. So it would be similar to driving down the road today, and somebody pulls you over, a policeman, and says, I just saw you speeding. And you ask him, how does he know you were speeding? And he says, I think so. And then, by the way, you don't go to court and prove yourself. He just takes your keys. So that's what it is today in the walking room. So I'm going to interrupt you there, because we're going to talk about that more of that in uh, tomorrow's. But uh, I think, too, if we all want to work together to uh, try to move ahead with this horse to help the horse, that maybe it does help to find out what is in somebody's mind that they should do this. And um, that's why I was asking this question. So why shortcut? Because they probably don't want to spend time training. All right. Uh, Teresa, do you, do you have something you want to add on it? It's, it's, we're talking about human mindset and why somebody would do something like this. It, well, it's difficult to really respond to. Um, I believe Duke did mention, you know, it's a shortcut, definitely. Um, I will say that based upon conversations that I've had with numerous people who have looked at this issue, they have said it's a culture of abuse, and that was from the American Association of Equine Practitioners in their white paper that they put out in 2008. And even the American Horse Council says the abuse is systemic throughout the entire um, big lick groups. So it's there in great numbers, and so, um, as I said, everyone has learned to take a short cut. I'm uh, Dr. Dr. B, uh, from Tennessee Walking Horse, and I know you have a lot of experience with horse racing. Why do something like this to an animal? What's the mindset to deal with it? I think in all the uses of horses, it is a shortcut. Uh, and I think we're losing some of the horsemanship we used to have in general in all the breeds the disciplines and the time to train. You can't make an athlete become a super athlete in six months. So there's time, there's money, political pressures, and generational. I don't know that each generation as uh, they come along are as experienced as the previous generation. Some of it might be cultural, too, from the previous days where this was accepted, but we've become more aware of what's going on. And so I believe that there should be some common ground here. It's kind of hard not to think that there is. And you mentioned something too, and I possibly do. You did that with shortcuts at all. It could be based on money too. It's, it's down to the dollar, and if you can get it out faster, you maybe be able to make more money out of that. I'd like to add a point. Um, systematic. I choose to mention that the USDA's own rates are 92 to 98 percent uh, compliance rate. Uh, Repeat that? That shows. Oh, yeah. make, make I didn't understand you. Plant, please. Repeat what you said. Excuse me. I do want to address the USDA and the PAST Act. Can we hold that until that next question? Sure. So please, hold your question. Thank you. Okay. I've got um, a follow-up on, ma'am, on your subject. This is not a debate, this Plant. This is the subject that he brought up. This is, I assign the question to Plant, please. Plant. What? I assign the question. I'm the mommy. To to you will be able to respond to it, but not right now. You're wasting time for the other panelists. Well, what if we get, no one, the no, role I, everybody's of, responded except me to what he said, which is your question. You will have a chance to do it. Not now. Thank yes, you. Yes, now. Carl Bledsoe no. said, and he's a trainer, okay? Some help here, please? As long as there was a chain and pad on these horses, they're going to suffer. What y'all are missing is you can't have the big lick without suffering. And Dr. John Hamilton is an expert witness testifies that. If you don't comply, we're going to pull you out of this. Why can't I just respond? You will be able to respond to the end. You need to listen to the mod. It is not your time to talk. You your choice. If you do this again, we're going to pull you out of here. Excuse me. The role of rescue and advocacy, the pros and cons of uh, Big Lake Tennessee Walking Horse, rescue and advocacy. Uh, let's see. Uh, Jeannie, can you address pros and cons of ad uh, advocacy on this issue? Well, it. <laughs> 
here we are at the film festival, and I would actually just like to preface this by saying something that I experienced last year here at the film festival. I was so amazed and impressed with a team of women who sat on a panel who each came from a different cause, a different purpose, a different goal. And it wasn't really the actual issue about what was happening and harm that horses were suffering. It was the amazing commitment that they made. But one of the things that was common among all of these women, from lawyers to horsewomen, was that they were practical. Their message was simple and honest. It was factual. It didn't base itself in emotion and distraction. And so they were credible. And this is so important in any cause. We need to remain credible by giving fair and honest information without exaggeration. And we need to be accurate as possible as far as what the legal terms and the outcome will be. Thank you. Uh, Teresa, do you have anything to add on that? No? I, be I believe your question was about advocacy, the role of rescue and advocacy, the pros and cons. Okay, one of the five missions has always been to educate and promote the sound, humanely trained Tennessee walking horse. So we have always felt that education is our number one tool. And so we have used that uh, to a great extent the last 15 years as people have come to us who have rescued horses and we've been able to relate to the fact that their horse may have mental and emotional damage, not just physical damage, from the effects of soaring. And so we believe that education is huge with respect to the advocacy role. Uh, do, how about you, um, the, the, the role and the pros and cons of rescue and advocacy? Um, we own 30 Tennessee walking horses, so I guess we've rescued 30 Tennessee walking horses. Can you explain that? Uh, yeah, we get up in the morning at 6 o'clock, we feed them, we feed them three times a day. I finish my day at 8.30 at night, feeding them treats, mucking their stalls, and going home. So um, that's our rescue mission. All right, uh, typically, <laughs> Uh, a rescue has to do with taking taking a horse that has been at risk and moving it on to the next life. Uh, do you have a, a okay. uh, the past act? Uh, where are we now with the past act and with the USD Horse Protection Act amendment that uh, was going on at the end of summer, beginning of fall? Uh, Clint, would you address that, where we are with that? The past act is dead. It's over. It's finished. It's done for. Why would you say that? Because Mitch McConnell is the Senate Majority Leader, and Mr. Thorson's crowd pays $12,000 a month to a lobbyist named Mr. Jeff Speaks. Can Good we not job. make it personal? No, it's factual, Ms. Wade. Can we not make it personal? We need to be respectful of everybody. I'm very respectful. Please. Mr. Thorson runs one of the higher end big league barns there is. I know. It's a clean operation. I respect you. I've seen your horses. I've stood out there in front of these protests. I've seen your rig come in. You do things first class. But the system is basically flawed. And I would like to read Mr. Carl Webb's statement. I talked to him before this meeting. This is what he said. Is this about the past act? This, wait, you can send it to me if want you want to. I want to know if what you're going to say has to do with the question. It always has to do with the past act, because the past act is to prevent all soaring tactics. And Mr. Bledsoe says as long as there's a chain and pad on those horses, they're going to suffer. They're going to be compliant at the horse show, which is what you're talking about with inspection, but they still have to suffer. And Dr. Hafner at MTSU, veterinarian, said you cannot have this business <coughs> built on the suffering and pain of horses. So it's basically flawed from the very beginning. Thank you for letting me Thank express you. myself, and I appreciate it. Uh, Teresa, where, where are we now today with the past act? Please. I would say that the PATH Act for this session of Congress is um, dead. Um, as we know, we um, have a president-elect and are trying to get a lot of things done at this time. The PATH Act would eliminate the stacks and the chains and would eliminate the um, industry self-regulation and inspections and it would put that back with the USDA to do the inspections. And in light of all of the work that has been done by AAEP and AVMA and also the Office of the Inspector General, that's where they found um, the need with respect to getting rid of SORM. So at this time, as I said, the PATH Act is dead. Um, Senator McConnell has been very sympathetic to the Bigwood groups, but we have hopes and expect it to be introduced again next year. Thank you. 
why, sh why is having a USDA or APIS oversight for a uh, Tennessee walking horse, why is there a need for that? And uh, I will kind of curve it around when I get to you, Dr. B. Uh, how does the racing industry deal with horse protection issues? So uh, why, why do we need the USDA to be involved in this? And we'll start with Dr. B, please. Honest answers, I don't know. Um, Thank you. I, I really don't. Um, a few years ago, we had this international racing panel to talk about medication resources. And we had a spokesperson there who was an attorney and in charge of the National Baseball League. And he said, if you don't self-regulate yourself, the government's going to find a way to regulate you. I think that's true about all these disciplines. And you even look at uh, the circus, which I think it's a shame we lost the use of the elephants. The kids don't get to see what's going on. And I've been involved with them a little bit, and, and they're really good people, and they care about the elephants, just like the carriage horse people care about their horses. Each one of these groups has to take an interest in their own sport. They're all different. Uh, the average public doesn't really understand about the action of the Tennessee Walker and why it's the way it is and what it takes to train them. But I think all these groups, the only thing I can say is they should self-regulate as best they can to avoid having to be regulated by outside agencies. But if they can't self-regulate themselves and open themselves up to the public, how to cry into these organizations regulating them. Thank you. Uh, Duke, what, what is your thought on uh, the USDA and the APIS oversight of Tennessee walking horses? Uh, well, in the past act there was two alternative bills and there was two ways to get to the point. The, Past Act was written to eliminate pads and action devices. The belief of us is that those do not cause soaring. Uh, the USDA themselves in the late 80s created the Auburn study, uh, which by several of the organizations that Ms. Pippen just mentioned a little while ago, uh, were involved in the comments that created the Auburn study where pads and action devices, six ounces or less, do not cause soaring. So the problem is, what does cause soaring and how do you detect it? That's what you have to do. Our legislation, uh, was based on objective testing, science-based, blood testing, swabbing. If you can get on an airplane today and not be scared somebody sitting next to you has a gun or gunpowder, I think we can swab any horse's leg for anything we want to, as long as we know what we want to swab for. So what's wrong about the current method is if you put fly spray on a quarter horse, you put fly spray on an air, or if you put fly spray on a Tennessee walking horse, the Tennessee walking horse going down the road at a horse show is illegal. That's a foreign substance. So that's what all these tickets that everybody likes to talk about 99.9% .9 have been based on foreign substance, which is sulfur in the water at a fairgrounds, and scar roll, and sensitivity. Sensitivity is very subjective by how you uh, grab the horse, and, uh, and scar roll is based on biopsy or not, or an opinion. Is that a scratch, is that a cut, is that acne, or is that a scar? It is very clear in the Horse Protection Act on what a scar is, both legs. If somebody's ever going to soar a horse and I can do one leg or the other because you're judged on both being even. That protocol has not been followed. Thank you. Uh, Judy, do you have anything to add to that? <laughs> well, I think that because we have an audience here that isn't completely familiar with all the details and terms and, and stories about the Tennessee Walking Horse, one of the things that's important for me to share with my equine peers is this. This breed is not in did not begin, the Horse Protection Act, in, Act did not begin as a government regulation. It was a government intervention. This breed association, that of the walking horse, never regulated from within for the first 35 years of its existence until 1970. So in 1970, there was no regulation whatsoever. There was nothing going on. There were no rules written. There was no rule book to adhere to regarding the actual treatment of the animals in the show ring. And it became so extreme that the government was had no choice to but step in. Now we would all rather not have to be governed by the, the regulations, but we have no choice because this breed, unlike many others, and in fact pretty much all others, never did their own work cleaned up their own act, and they still to this day have a problem with a compromise or any kind of effort in a full-blown revisiting and repurposing of this breed. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to put this question to the whole panel. Uh, 
whole panel, uh, what action can the audience take to benefit the Tennessee walking course? Uh, uh, let's start with you, Duke. I think look at uh, the legislation we had, which now has turned into a rulemaking for this past year. Um, so there's 120 page comments we have turned in on the various groups that I represent, uh, the Leadership Council and the uh, uh, not, not um Based on what I have just kind of outlined, objective testing, one HIO. The other problem with a HIO, which is a uh, oversight of the DQPs, the inspectors at each of the show, is that when you created several across the country, you created a competitive environment. So what was going on for a period of time is you would have less stringent uh, inspections going on at one show versus another. Let so me stop you. Help, help the audience if they're interested in this. What could they do? What do you recommend that they do from your point of view? To, um, to help the Tennessee walking course? Well, my opinion would be to support our bill and, and uh, of objective testing and 1HIO. Is there something else that they could do? No, that would be the best right now. All right, thank you. Uh, Teresa, what, what can the audience do to help the course? Um, I absolutely believe that the best course of action is to support the um, pass back, prevent all soaring techniques, and also educate yourself about the wonderful charm of the Tennessee walking horse. They can be used in all types of disciplines. They do not need to be soared. And by learning more about the Tennessee walking horse and how it can be used and promoted, we'll be helping educate others about how important it is to end soaring and to end the big leg. Dr. B, people that are interested in Tennessee walking horses, what can the audience do here to benefit this breed? Speak to whoever you know in the in the industry or any of your legislators to just be fair and make sure that the sport self-regulates itself as best they can for the benefit of the horse. I hate to lose the use of this horse or any horse. I want to um, reiterate what Teresa said. I think that what is super important here, and I would ask of my fellow equestrians, is to you please be aware that there really are kind of two different types here, what we're talking about with the Tennessee walking horse. There's the big leg performance horse, which a lot of people are familiar with now seeing images and videos. But the Tennessee walking horse, in its original intent, is what we're looking to try to recover for the breed and for the future and for the positive aspects of prosperous industry. What's the question, please? It is, uh, what action can the audience take to benefit the breed of the Tennessee walking horse? Pray and support Secretary Tom Vilsack, who the public has expressed their opinion on this. 95% are for removing the pads and chains to abolish the big lick. That's under consideration. Hopefully it will be done before the end of the present administration. Pray. Thank you. Thank you. I, I kind of moved everybody along because I, I'm sure that the audience has a lot of questions and that the panel members have other things they want to say as I rein them in as I said uh, and I will ask you please I am going to kind of step back a little bit but uh, I'm going to ask everybody to be pleasant with each other and respect each other I know this is a very passionate subject but it, we'll, we'll all be able to hear each other a little bit better and learn from each other if uh, we take a deep breath. So uh, I'll take questions now. You can direct it to a specific panelist or you can just shout it out. Uh, Mr. Wade. <laughs> no, I have a question for Duke. Uh, thinking in terms of bicycle riders and all the abuses that have gone on in uh, bike racing for years, why would you, running a clean barn, agree to compete against trainers that are known to be or have very bad track records and are probably bringing horses into the ring that have been soared, why would you agree to compete against them with a clean horse? Well, there's only so many horse shows and my daughter likes to show horses. So we have 30 horses, majority of them are flat shot horses, by the way. Uh, and by the way, you can soar a flat shot horse. And we have seen more of that in recent times than I have seen on performance horses. So. They're both things that you need to have an inspection process. Any Tennessee walking horse show has an inspector. So 100% go through inspection. On the way in the ring, top three typically on the way out. 
So make that clear, there is an inspection process. What you need to do is improve your inspection process. If that is working, you don't have to worry about who's at the show and getting in the ring that you're against, that, that, you know, or you're competing against that's not doing the right thing. Thank you. Yes, may I ask you the same question? Is the majority, like, my name is Kathy. Or, oh, I'm sorry. I'm Kathy from Reclaim Pro Exchange. You said the majority of the horses are flat shot. You previously said you had 30 horses. What are, which ones are not flat shot? How many? Uh, top of my head, probably five now. So what types of shoes do they have if they're not flat shot? If they're not, there would be a, a, a pad and an action device when they go to the show. Okay, so help me understand, we talked earlier about a shortcut in horsemanship or a shortcut in training processes. It's also for an exaggerated gait because there's a reward at that end, correct? So if the gait is exaggerated, it's not just a shortcut in the process, it's a quick end to a specific result. Well, several things have to happen there. I mean, you also have to have judging, it's judging the proper things. Well, you say proper things. So if we eliminated any pinning for any horses that have big legs, wouldn't that eliminate the problem? What's pinning? Pinning, um, I'm sorry, uh, giving an award to, giving a ribbon to. Well, I mean, naturally the horse does what it does. So if it gets through the inspection process, then it is on equal ground. So if several horses are big legs and one does not? They don't compete against each other. Okay. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say good evening, and uh, I would like to thank this board, uh, regardless of what your opinions are, is that we're all here, I hope, for the love of the horse, we're all horses. So if we start there in the conversation of, if you love horses, anything that you would see, whether it's thoroughbreds running at two years old and the lambs going down, whether it's the walking horse, if it's causing pain, look at it the same way you would look at your children. If your child is participating in something in sports or whatever, bullying or whatever, and is causing pain and trauma, you happen to be something that is coming up that I, I'm in a doomsday. My board tomorrow will be about horse rescue. The amount of horses, because of the abuse of making money and overbreeding the horses because you break them down too fast because you're abusing them. That's why there's thoroughbred horse racing with Tennessee walking horses. So what they have to do is that we have another conversation going on about how do we stop the slaughter. What I'm trying to just end with is that anything that we're doing that we love these horses, and my program is called For the Love of the Horse, if we step out of the place and say, step into the position of the horse, if you're causing that horse pain, whether it's a dog or horse, whatever, but we're in the horses, and I want to thank this board and the Equus Film Festival for us to be able to start here because this hasn't been around. You know, not, a lot of people don't know about horse slaughter or the abuse of these horses. So this is the format that is introducing us to talk that can go mainstream so that we can get the people to decide whether your technique is worthy or not worthy and vote on it. And it's going to have to be a public. It's going to come down to looking at, uh, looking at this, this problem through the eyes of humanity. Jar, do you have a specific question for any of the panelists? <laughs> well, my, my, my thing was, is the only thing that I, we work with the World Veterinarian Association, especially in endurance. The number one goal is not to hurt the horse. If that horse is lame or coming and hurt, we stop the race. That should be the same thing in the ring. That should be the same thing that you have to qualify to come in, and not with pain and medicine. So I would like to say, do you think that we need, not the boards and the horse organizations, but we need to have more of you all involved about really the protection and the abuse that is given to these owners for human pleasure? Dr. B, do you? Like, yeah. like Brian, I'm going to try to interpret your question. <laughs> do we need more of you involved? Well, I, don't, I just represent me, I don't represent the veterinary world. And the veterinary world is just as mixed as this panel here. There's those that go to work every day to make sure a horse wins a race, and that's all they care about. And then there's others that think that horses should never race, and that's wrong too. There's extremes. So, 
that's why my whole message is to try to regulate your own association, your own beliefs, your own followings for each sport because I'm not an authority on Tennessee walking horses no more than I'm an authority on any other specific breed. There's about five things that I know very well. But I do agree with what you said, that we're pushing all these horses too quick, too soon. And then they're like our kids. And if we push them too, too hard, too fast, and then when they break down, we kick them out the door, someone else has to take care of them. Now, in the thoroughbred world right now, there's a lot of organizations. Some are better than others where they adopt and repurpose these horses. So my whole message is to try to keep these guys going as long as you can, to try to use age-old training techniques so that we don't break them down. The less medication you use and less soaring devices and things to exaggerate gait, the better they'll be. But there's a realistic pressure that uh, time and money and politics makes up everything. Jar, uh, Mr. Say had an answer. Do you, do you mind if he also answers your question? The American Veterinary Medical Association is on record for abolishing the pads and the chain. This is not complicated. The American Association of Econ Protectors is on record. They're in front of Congress for abolishing the pads and chains. And one more time, the big lick is animal cruelty. According to Don Hafner, MTSU, horse science professor, equine vet, native of Tennessee, who used to take care of big lick horses. It doesn't get any more conclusive than that. And Mr. Thorson loves his horses. I know he does. Okay? I know he does. And I don't question that. All right? Thank you. I don't care whether she comes in here or not. <laughs> uh, there's a lady back here with a red sweatshirt. Can you I'm, I mean, I'm really familiar with uh, the Tennessee Walking Horses and everything, but. When I listen to issues, I have a question for Teresa. You quoted something that you referenced from eight years ago um, about soaring and policies or procedures or what they did. And my question is, why would you quote something so long ago or use something that eight years ago, what has changed in those eight years to make something different? Um, what I quoted was the AAEP white paper that was produced, and every few years they produce a, a white paper. And um, when they put this out in 2008, they said it was one of the most significant welfare issues affecting any equine breed or discipline. It's a culture of abuse. And so after they issued that white paper, after doing all of their investigation, um, I believe that what the AAEP did do at that point, they started working also with the AVMA in order to put together some kind of policy to help the Tennessee Walking Force. And that's how the PAST Act came about, and this is the third session that's been introduced. So if you think about six years ago, the PAST Act was introduced about two years after they came up with that paper. The gentleman with, with the cowboy hat. Um. I, I differ with you on one, one thing, and that is the PAST Act did not come up from the AEP and the ABMA. The PAST Act came up from the Humane Society of the United States. And that is, without a doubt, the first word I want everybody here that's a horse person that's not involved with the Tennessee Walkers or involved with anything else involved with horses. That is a way in the door to have USDA inspectors put us all out of business at horse shows everywhere. And like Duke said, if, you, if I've been to several, I've trained horses and shown them for 25 years. I go to lots of fairgrounds. Okay, there's sulfur in the water there. And if you wash your horse, bathe your horse with those, that water, it's going to test. And if people, this is a very slippery slope. There's rules already on the books for the soaring. The big lick, if you want to get rid of the big lick, get rid of it. Work on that. But don't sit here and tell me that they're soaring and you're not telling me who's soaring. I tried to get everybody to tell me last night. Nobody could name anybody. They, 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 they want to point the finger at Duke. But how many times have you been tested, Duke? We've been through inspection over 2,000 times. And not once, right? So who's soaring who? I'd like to respond to that, please. With respect to the foreign substance test, 
before the USDA started um, doing those and reporting those results, they went to numerous Tennessee walking horse shows across the entire country in order to establish a baseline of what the foreign substance results could be. And so they set that up in order, because as you said, there's sulfur in the water, there's diesel fuel on the grounds, and so after they started recording these results, the flat shot shows that were inspected, and believe me, they use diesel fuel, they're washing their horses also, they came up with zero foreign substance violations at their show. You can go and look at the results online. With respect to the past fact, there are many organizations that support it. In fact, there are over 300, and the AVMA director, Rhonda Haven, testified on the panel with me in front of Congress that they were 100% behind the past act. So, I mean... But they did not originate it. The they Humane testified Society 100 United States in front of it, and they also su submitted comments in favor of the new regulations. So they are completely behind it, and they were lobbying for it, along with the American Horse Council. When, uh, what I'd like to do is I have another question here from Pauline, <coughs> and... Uh, we're given a few more minutes, and then if anybody wants to go out and talk about this individually, we have all the space that we need. Please, you had a question for somebody? Yes, thank you. We have um, talked a little bit about self-regulation and the need for it. Um, I'd like to uh, have Ms. McGuire comment on the breed registry's um, stance on that. The, the stance of the breed registry on on self-regulation. On self-regulation. <coughs> so what we have is we have um, many, many, many American breeds, foreign breeds, and equestrian sports that are governed, and they are self-governed. So a great example is the American Quarter Horse Association. If you visit the American Quarter Horse Association APRAJ website, you'll see that they have a very strong enforcement policy regarding animal welfare or horse welfare and the abuse towards any horses. If horses are found abused in an ex a, a competition, there's channels to follow immediately from within the AQHA. There will be a menu on their website that will actually show you that there are members of the AQHA who have been suspended. Their membership has been revoked. They've been banned permanently, and that is shared publicly amongst other breeds or places that those trainers or, or individuals would be competing. That does not exist for the Tennessee Walking Horse. That breed association does not monitor in that fashion, not one bit. That's what they rely. The breed association actually is reliant on the USDA and the government to do this because of the Horse Protection Act that was um, started in 1970 as a regulatory process. It's not a successful one. Nothing that the government does usually is tremendously successful. They need more money and they don't get enough of this. This is why the past act came along. And actually, in all fairness, as I spoke before, I feel strongly that we need to be accurate in our information and there's no information that's documented that the Humane Society is the architect of the past act but there is information documented that the American Horse Council is the architect of the past act mostly with the majority of the language and the past act is upheld by industry stakeholders so we the people agree with the wording and the content of the past act Thank you. Uh, we're going to take one more question, and then Diana had something she wanted to say. All right, two, but you have to make it fast. I will. And uh, no, my. Oh, it's uh, and then, uh, Wait, wait, wait. This lady is first. <laughs> and then we'll go outside. And we'll uh, talk my about question. Uh, my question is to you, sir. Um, you answered an earlier question, um, and the answer was we let them go out and do what they naturally do. So my question to you is. How is it that you and the Tennessee walking industry uh, see that having horses with that on their feet is natural? How can you help us understand that you think that's a natural thing? Well, it's no different. It's an extension, and that, that would be based on a very large foot. There's laws by the USDA on how big that is. Just like six ounces or less has to be based on the size of the foot, the heel-to-toe ratio. So you can't just throw anything on it and get through inspection. Uh, a long-time horse person here, natural horse woman, I also work in sports a bit also, I know there's good and bad, but again, there is nothing natural about the confirmation of any horse, whether it's a miniature horse, a draft horse, that is shod like that. You can ask any farrier that has 
any natural horsemanship. So that, there's nothing that you can add the word natural to having that on the foot. And to me, I just don't understand how this, uh, the Tennessee walking community thinks that's a natural thing. I think we're referring to as the natural lift and the natural action of the person. Uh, gentlemen, right here, that'll be our last question, and then it's Diana's turn. Uh, I'm an agricultural economist, and I've lived in Middle Tennessee for 17 years. And what I've observed in the last five years, I don't understand, which is the demise of the walking horse economy. Because from my point of view, from my perspective, failure to respond to the will of the public and the increased enforcement of regulations. And I just don't understand, having gone to Shelbyville for shows over the, off and on over that period of 17 years, the last time this year, I don't understand why the industry has not recognized, hey folks, this ain't working for us in the pocketbook. Maybe we ought to get off those skills. I don't understand it. Can you, as a person from money and background in horses, explain that to me? I would agree with you. Uh, there's a public perception that obviously is part of what you do. And is that where you're not getting your uh, particip participants or crowds or, or whatever it is? Uh, however, the majority of what you see in the decimation of the industry is coming from uh, pressure, primarily from groups like Clamp, that go out and Citizens. use information. Citizens. They use information that is created off of things that I've been saying, which are not accepted in any other breed. And that is, because of the law around this breed and this horse, you can have a foreign substance violation that nobody does anything with it. The government doesn't do anything, but it's a list. So they create lists on all these different actions and scar rules and et cetera to create a, uh, a aggression of citizens, as he wants to call it, to try to oust people from coming into the debris. The second part is the inspection process. When somebody flies across country to show a horse, their horse is perfectly sound and doesn't get in because it's uh, your horse is foreign substance. There's no foreign substance on it. All right, now I'm going to get you a sky rule. Those are words from inspectors that are at the, on behalf of the USDA. And you have, to, you, you have to fly home and not show your horse. There's no proof of it. You're guilty as charged. There's no fine. There's no nothing. You're just guilty and you just wasted your money. After a while, people are sick of it. They're not going to put up with it anymore. That is why we're saying have objective inspections. So if you get picked up for speeding, you've got a radar gun. That's been calibrated, by the way, in your court case, if you want to take it that far, or whatever you were picked up for, there's some <coughs> objective reason on why you're getting charged and paying a fine or put away for what you should be doing as guilty. But if you're not, don't just sit and pick on somebody because you want to, because you don't have an opinion, you don't like it. That's the difference in, in, the, uh, in the two uh, various legislations that we have. Thank you. Uh, do we have time for any more questions? I want, I want to just say one thing to that, please. One, just real quick. I deal with the horse industry over the whole horse industry, okay? So the whole, the registry, you talk about the Tennessee walkers going way down. Everybody, everybody is down. The AQHA is down over 78% on registered foals. So don't think you can't you can't just lay it on the the walkers. I mean, there's a reason the econ the horse economy is in the toilet, and it's just some of it's just starting to come back. But there is there. I mean, every breed registry out there is down huge amounts. So you can't blame it all on what's going on. I want you to realize that there's. I just wanted to add that part that that every registry out there is down. Thank you. I want to thank the panel for coming so prepared and sharing your information with us. I want to thank the audience. I want to thank the audience for your interest and your participation. Uh, Diana has something that she wants to say, but by all means, please come out here, continue your conversations. Uh, we had great conversations last year when uh, people came, got out of this session and I got out of the way. So talk to each other. The only way that we're going to get through all this. Thank you, Diana. You know, what I want to say is that I'm, I'm sort of really proud of the Equus Film Festival, which at this point is Lisa Gerson, who is the founder, and myself. Because we have come to the table. We've come to the table and we're talking about it. We had to deal with 
some difficult issues where when you say to the people, let's come to the table and talk about it, they don't want to do that. They want to have their side and you want to have your other side. We think that we're right. Each one of us thinks that we're right. But the point is we need to come to the table because maybe someone else is going to teach us something that we don't know so that we can compromise and do what needs to be done for the horse. So I thank you, everybody in the audience, and I truly thank every one of the panelists here for coming to the table and bringing some light on this issue and being willing to discuss it. Timeless fence systems, they're non-conductive, they're self-insulating, they're maintenance-free. Beyond that, they're very easy to install. They'll last for years and years. Timeless fence systems. Check them out. And we'd like to introduce you to L&D Trailers. They're announcing their dealership featuring Equitrek, horse trailers of Britain. A full line of high-quality trailers, and soon they're going to be introducing total vans. Horse trailers and comfortable quarters, Equitrek and LD trailers.